Thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our paper to this uh, wonderful program. It's a pleasure to present here. This is joint work with Daron Levit and Ernst Maug. And let me start with the motivation for what we do. So in recent decades, we have observed a secular shift from board primacy to shareholder voting in many advanced economies. As a result of both regulations and charter amendments, shareholders now vote not only on director elections, auditors and M&A deals, but also on corporate governance issues, executive compensation, and environmental and social policies. And very often, this shift of power towards shareholder voting takes for granted that it increases shareholder welfare by giving power to the people, to those who own the shares, which is a form of corporate democracy. However, there is an important difference between the corporate setting and the political setting. And in particular, in the corporate setting, there are financial markets, which allow investors to choose their ownership stakes in companies based on their preferences and based on the stock price. And since voting rights can be traded, the shareholder base and hence the voting base is endogenous. This link between trading and voting leads to an important feedback loop. On the one hand, expected voting outcomes affect shareholders' valuations and that in turn determines shareholders' trading decisions. But then trading decisions in turn determine the composition of the shareholder base and who is eligible to vote and thus affect voting outcomes. Finally, understanding the link between trading and voting is now especially important given the recent trends, such as the growth in index funds who vote but don't trade and the importance of uh, rising importance of environmental and social issues which affect investors beyond their ownership stakes in companies. So our goal in this paper is to examine this link between trading and voting. And as we show, it has important implications for prices, shareholder welfare, and the choice between shareholder democracy and board primacy. What we do is we consider a theoretical framework in which shareholders trade and then vote on a proposal. And you can think of a merger and acquisition proposal, a proxy fight, or various ESG issues. So first, shareholders trade in a competitive market. Then they receive news about the proposal, which you can think of as proxy advisors' recommendations or disclosures by management. And after that, they vote, and the proposal is accepted if uh, it receives enough voting uh, support, for example, about 50%. Importantly, shareholders have heterogeneous preferences regarding the proposal. And here we uh, follow the long line of legal and finance literature, which suggests that it is simply not true that the preferences of shareholders are likely to be similar. Uh, we have several recent papers showing differences in governance philosophy of mutual funds, differences in social and political ideology, as well as a long line of literature showing other differences, characteristics such as time horizon, tax differences, and so forth. So how do these differences manifest themselves? So remember, when shareholders vote, uh, they observe some news about the proposal. And let's denote this news as Q. And suppose large Q stands for good news and a small Q stands for bad news. Those shareholders who have preferences towards the proposal, we call them activist shareholders. Since they like the proposal, they require relatively little evidence to vote in its favor, which means they apply a relatively low cutoff uh, on this news in order to vote in favor. On the other hand, there are other shareholders who we call conservative shareholders. They like the status quo and are biased against the proposal. And that means they require a lot of evidence uh, that the proposal is value increasing in order to vote uh, in its favor. So they apply a high cutoff on now, how do shareholders' heterogeneous preferences manifest themselves in trading? Suppose that when shareholders trade, they anticipate that the proposal will be approved if the news about it is sufficiently high, uh, good, uh, so the Q is above a certain cutoff. There are two possible scenarios, as we show. One scenario is that the cutoff Q star is small, which means that shareholders require relatively little evidence for uh, the proposal to be approved. So the proposal is very likely to be approved. In this case, activist shareholders who have a bias towards the proposal will value the firm more than conservative shareholders because their preferred outcome is likely to be accepted. 
you can see shareholders valuation of the firm increases and shareholders bias towards the report. And that means that during trading, there are now gains from trade, shareholders who are conservative and value the firm more or less will sell their shares to shareholders who are activists and have a higher willingness to pay, which is what we refer to as the activist equilibrium. And the shareholder who is just indifferent between buying and selling at the market clearing price, we call him the marginal trader, determines the stock price in the market. Essentially, what happens is matching between firms and shareholders. Shareholders who like the expected outcome will end up owning the firm. So this is the first scenario when the proposal is likely to be approved. Another scenario is when this cutoff on use is sufficiently high, meaning that shareholders require a lot of evidence for the proposal to be approved, so it's quite likely to be rejected. In this case, it's the conservative shareholders who dislike the proposal, who now value the firm more relative to the activist shareholders. And thus, during trading, activist shareholders will sell their shares to conservatives, and we'll again observe this matching between firms and shareholders. Now that we understand how these heterogeneous preferences affect trading and voting, let's look at the implications for voting. So when uh, voting occurs after trading, very importantly, this trading affects the shareholder base and the shareholder base in turn determines the voting outcome. For example, in the activist equilibrium where more activist shareholders end up owning the firm, these will be the shareholders who will be voting for the proposal for or against the proposal. And uh, among these shareholders, there is a shareholder who will call the median voter. Uh, this is the shareholder whose vote essentially determines or always coincides with the voting outcome. If this median voter has the median preferences among this post-trade shareholder base votes in favor of the proposal, then everyone who is more activist than him also votes in favor, so the proposal is approved. While if this median voter votes against the proposal, everyone who is more conservative than him will also vote against, and hence the proposal will be rejected. So the median voter essentially determines what will happen to the proposal. Similarly, in the conservative equilibrium, the median voter will now be among this post-trade shareholder base, which is more conservative. So what are the implications of these, uh, of these arguments? Our first implication is that when uh, trading determines the composition of the voting of the voter base, there is non-fundamental indeterminacy. And what we mean by that is that the activist and conservative equilibrium can coexist. Intuitively, due to trading, expectations about voting outcomes become self-fulfilling. For example, suppose that the proposal is expected to be accepted. Then, as we saw, activists have higher valuation than conservatives. They end up buying the shares and then at the voting stage, since they are predisposed towards the proposal, they indeed likely to approve uh, the proposal confirming these ex ante expectations. Similarly, if the proposal is expected to be rejected, conservatives value the firm more, buy shares from activists, and since they dislike the proposal, end up rejecting the proposal sufficiently often. And this dynamics is consistent with the evidence uh, in a recent paper by Cox, Mandina and Thomas, which show large ownership changes in M&A targets after the deal announcement, and importantly, the association between these ownership changes with the subsequent likelihood that the deal is approved by the shareholders. The non-fundamental indeterminacy that I just discussed presents a potential empirical challenge to analyzing voting, because Similar firms with similar fundamental characteristics can have different ownership structures and voting outcomes. And we show that indeterminacy is more likely when there are potentially larger swings in the shareholder base, when the firm's shares are more liquid, when it has fewer long-term non-transient shareholders such as index funds, and for proposals that uh, have substantial preference heterogeneity uh, across the shareholders, such as proposals on environmental and social issues. Our second implication concerns prices and shareholder welfare. And in particular, we show that stock, the stock price and shareholder welfare can move in opposite direction. To understand how this can happen, uh, let me uh, uh, explain what determines the stock price and shareholder welfare. Remember that the stock price is the relation of the marginal trader. This is the shareholder who is 
just in different between buying and selling. This is the most conservative shareholders uh, in the post-trade shareholder base in the sector of equilibrium. Uh, on the other hand, shareholder welfare, which we define as the welfare of the initial shareholder base, equals, as we show, the valuation of the average shareholder who holds the shares post-trading. So in this post-trade shareholder base, the average shareholder determines the shareholder wealth. Importantly, both the marginal trader and the average shareholder uh, value the firm, their valuations of the firm depend on who the median voter is, because the median voter determines the voting outcome. And in particular, the stock price will be higher if the median voter is closer to the marginal trader because then the marginal trader's preferences will be implemented and shareholder welfare will be higher if the median voter is closer to the average post trade shareholder. So now we can understand how prices and welfare can move in opposite directions. So consider the marginal trader and the average post trade shareholder which determine price and welfare uh, respectively. And suppose that the marginal voter is right in between them. Suppose there is some corporate governance change, for example, an increase in the majority requirement of the firm. This increase in the majority requirement will make the median voter more conservative because now more evidence is required uh, for the proposal to be approved. So the median voter moves to the left, approaching the marginal trader and moving farther away from the average post trade shareholder which suggests that the stock price will increase and the shareholder welfare will decrease. In the paper, we also show that price and welfare reactions to voting outcomes can have opposite signs, and that suggests that there is a potential limitation to the interpretation of event studies of shareholder voting. We also discuss when this price welfare discrepancy is potentially larger and show that it's larger when the shareholder base is more heterogeneous post-trade and when the voting outcome is more close. Our third implication is that greater opportunities to trade can be harmful for both prices and shareholder welfare. And intuitively, greater opportunities to trade allow more extreme investors to build large positions and then use their votes to implement their preferred policies, potentially harming the more moderate shareholder. And more, more formally, as the median, as trading opportunities increase, the median voter becomes more extreme and that might increase the gap between the median voter and for example, the average shareholder, which would decrease shareholder welfare. So this, uh, this conclusion suggests that potentially shareholders might benefit from delegating decision making to the board of directors instead of voting. And this is what we explore next. Our fourth application is that the board uh, that would maximize the welfare of the initial shareholders is necessarily biased, but nevertheless is preferred to voting. Uh, to see this, so suppose that shareholders trade, like uh, I uh, showed you before, but don't vote, and the decision of the proposal is taken unilaterally by the board of directors. Which board will maximize the welfare of the initial shareholders? As I mentioned before, the welfare of initial shareholders equals the valuation of the average post-trade shareholder. And that means that the optimal board should cater to the preferences of this average shareholder post-trade. So this would be the preferences of the optimal board that will maximize the welfare of the initial shareholders. As you can see, this optimal board is not a biased, an unbiased board. An unbiased board would cater to the preferences of the average initial shareholder and not to the preferences of the average post-trade shareholder. Intuitively, the optimal board is biased because it caters to the preferences of shareholders with the highest willingness to pay. And by catering to those shareholders, it also benefits these more moderate shareholders who are selling their, their shares because they can now sell at a higher price. So the optimal board is always biased, but nevertheless, shareholders benefit from delegating decision-making to this optimal, optimally biased board, as we show. And this means that the simple argument that whenever the board is biased, shareholder voting dominates board decision-making is not necessarily true when we take into account trade. Uh, in the paper, we consider several other implications. We show that short-term trading considerations may prevent shareholders from voting against delegating decision-making even to the optimal board. We discuss implications for index fund ownership and show that it can mitigate non-fundamental indeterminacy that I was referring to. 
in contrast, concerns about environmental and social issues can amplify non-fundamental indeterminacy and decrease the price. And we also have some follow-up work on the role of blockholders and the voting premium. So let me conclude. As we show in this paper, the link between trading and voting has important implications. It leads to non-fundamental indeterminacy. It emphasizes that financial markets have important real effects. For example, that trade can be harmful due to the voting externality. And on the question of the choice between shareholder democracy and board primacy, our key conclusion is that accounting for trading is crucial. Because as we showed, when shareholders can trade, a biased board is not necessarily dominated by shareholder voting. Thank you very much. And I very much look forward to your feedback. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, the discussion is Lian Yang from the University of Toronto. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. I'm going to make it a full screen. Perfect. Okay, great. So thank you very much for inviting me to discuss uh, this interesting paper. Uh, so, um, this is the summary of the paper. So uh, since Nadia had done a great job of presenting the results, so I am just kind of briefly uh, give you the notation of the paper so that this can mainly facilitate my discussion in the future. So this could mainly just have some notations. This is the study, the interaction between trade and the vote, two period, first trade and then vote. Uh, that the continuum of risk neutral players, those people have two uh, kind of components thing, they, they value the proposal that is the common element, which is the theta, the other one, sorry. Uh, the one is the theta, the other one is the bias, the private value. And then in the, in the financial market, they can either they sell their shares or they buy some, some uh, level, level up to some uh, positions. And in the between trade and the vote, there is also public information. The public information will change the belief about the common value theta. This is very important to drive the wedge between marginal trader and the marginal voter. That will drive a lot of interesting results. So uh, this is the notation part I want to mention. So the, the in equilibrium, there, there will be two threshold. One is a Q star, the other one is a B star. The Q star is a voting game. So in the voting game, it, the, the one proposal will be uh, adopted if and only if the public belief about, the, about that, the, that the common value theta is higher than Q star. The Q star is the indulgence. And also that the B star is the, in the trading game. It depends on two types of equilibrium. So people will buy or sell if and only if their single bias is larger than this, uh, this threshold B star. Basically the Q star and the B star will be simultaneously determined. So that, that, that's the equilibrium. This one is the voting equilibrium, the other one is the trading equilibrium. The paper is very, very rich, has a lot of results. So the first result is trading and voting always the complementary. So that, that, that can be multi, uh, multiple equilibrium. This is related to the feedback effect studied by many people in the audience, like we and, um, and, um, and, and, and Itai and myself, and we work on this uh, literature on the feedback effect. But the feedback effect traditionally is about either information or about uh, your uh, kind of contract. Here it's a very different about voting and so it's real action voting and also uh, trading the financial market. And also the price is not equal to welfare, market liquidity can reduce welfare and also show a bias that the board, the delegation can be better for welfare perspective, but it may not be supported by the uh, initial uh, pool of uh, shareholders and also talk about the paper also talk about the passive investing ESG a lot of results basically very very rich very very nice so this is the brief summary of the paper I just want to let you know so you focus on this Q star and B star I will later on use this to make a discussion so to set up the stage uh, so there are a lot of things that I like. And so the, these are three great theorists. I know them very well. And Nadia and, and Daron and Ernest, they are great theory people. They kind of, as always, they only focus on fundamental research questions and the uh, elegant model and the blah, blah, you can see it's a really, really great things. But I want to talk about some other kind of, I want to make some contributions basically here. So the two uh, bigger questions about the bigger picture and the interpretation of the results and also the channel between the, fun, the kind of the discrepancy between marginal trader and the marginal voter. I want to focus on these two comments. I also have some other comments in the, if I have time. Okay, the first one. 
so the, what the paper asks, the paper I think asks a very big question. Kind of you think about whether give the shareholders more power, it will be increased welfare or reduce the welfare. Intuitively, you just think of oh, this might increase the welfare because shareholders are they, they, they care about the welfare, so the decisions are made for them. But the decision might not be made by themselves, the decision made by kind of managerial team or board of directors. So if you give more power, more, more voting power to shareholders, you basically align incentives. So that can increase the welfare. That's the, the kind of the argument, the intuitive argument. And if you want to know whether this argument is good or bad, the, the current framework is very, very useful for think about this conceptual question. The, but to me, I think what, what the author should do, probably the following exercise, is which is different from what the current paper does. So my suggestion here is basically try to give a more direct answer to this question by looking at a different exercise. So specifically, remember that the Q stand B stand, that's the, the equilibrium in the, you allow people to trade and vote. So you have two thresholds, the Q star and the B star, both of them in order to determine, and then you can compute the social welfare. And then you now you compare with a benchmark, a hypothetical benchmark. In the hypothetical benchmark, you only allow people to trade, but not vote. So you, you think about that a vote is more like the corporate finance element. The trade is the financial market element. So you see, you, you like a corporate finance element exogenous. So, so you, you have this exogenous threshold, Q0. So when Q is larger than Q now, Q0, which is the giving, and you think about this Q0 can be implemented by a delegated managerial team of both of a director, but this Q0 is exalted giving. And this B star is still exalted determined by the trading game. And then you can compute the social welfare uh, for any exalted giving Q0. And then you compare them. Now, basically, you, you see for different Q0s, you might have this, this uh, Q star larger than this uh, benchmark or smaller, basically depending on the value of this Q0. So, okay, I think that, that's more direct answer to this question. This is this is. I think the paper touched upon this uh, exercise, but slightly different. Okay, I already five minutes are so fast. So uh, so basically, I think section five uh, is related, but but very different mm, kind of. You look at what the section five point one does. The the, the one point one does. Okay, it's asked in the benchmark. What's the optimal Q zero? That that's kind of what the section five one asks. So you ask. So suppose you have. Uh, a uh, key zero you can choose that can be implemented by uh, uh, a board or a managerial team. So what will be the optimal one? And by construction, the optimal one will be larger than the, the current equilibrium. That's by construction, but, but because you choose the optimal, right? the, the, the largest one. Uh, but I think probably that's kind of the first best the ideal case. That's not the policy question you want to address. And then the paper in the 5.2 say, okay, even if you have this biased board, so whether that can be supported by the initial shareholders, the result is, is no, depend on kind of the, the bias. But I think here it's also some the, the kind of the argument is a new asked. Because you think about the welfare, when you define the welfare, you assume that kind of so-called view of ignorance. So people don't know their bias, they are identical. And so the welfare is evaluated based on the before kind of the bias is realized, more like an expectation thing. But when you ask them to vote for, for this uh, uh, for this board, you, you you allow them to realize this that bias. So I think here that the discrepancy. If you also stick to the same uh, same kind of criterion, I think this board will be will be passed. Uh, so th that's my first um, kind of uh, uh, um, suggestion, basically. Another exercise directly answered the, the current question. I think because the paper had a lot of results, very, very rich, and it might be better off if you focus, you make the paper more focused. Uh, the next uh, comment is about the, um, so the, the main channel, the discrepancy between marginal voter versus the marginal trader. I have some conceptual question here, so mainly about the marginal voters, but let me start with the marginal trader. So the marginal trader in the current paper is well defined. You have a risk neutral investor with per position limits, and the marginal trader is basically the de defined by indifference. But if you have a risk averse investor without the position limits, that's not a well defined you know, because everybody is a marginal trader. So I think the better idea may be representative investor. I just give you a, a simple example. You think about the two investors, they have exponential utility. The fundamental value is given by this normal distribution, but also have a private value B, and that demand function is given by the, their valuation and the price. And according to market clear condition, you can see the price is affected by both investor bias. 
So B1 and B2 will affect the price and no one is a marginal trader. So everyone is a marginal, but you have a representative trader. So I, I think that might be a better uh, terminology, but if, I don't know how to translate it into sort of the current setup. Uh, but the, the next one is the marginal voter. I think this one, I have a more kind of um, quibbles. Uh, so be, now you have a continuum of uh, voters, all of them actually small. But the paper assume they they vote as a for pay voter. So I have kind of hard time to get my head around it. So people are, are, are small, but they also treat kind of treat themselves as a pay voter. That's kind of internally not a very not, not a very consistent. I but I think the um, the paper uh, um, refer to some um, uh, references to argue that the pe people also down the, this kind of assumption. I, I checked out the papers, but I still cannot understand exactly what's going on there. But to me, it's more like this uh, voting rule is, is very exogenous. Uh, but this is important to establish the, the uniqueness of the game, of the equilibrium in the, in the voting game. If you think about a, a simple national equilibrium, I think if you have a continuum of voters, it's very easy to have multiple equilibrium. You, you, you think about the support all investors vote yes, since each investor is, is small, and I probably borrow one more minute from the Q&A. And if it, it, each one is, 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 is relevant, then that yes, is the equilibrium. Also, if everyone votes for no, that's a no, it's also equilibrium. I think now the multiple equilibrium is, is will arise very naturally in this voting game. But since the paper highlights a lot of the multiplicity and indeterminacy uh, as, as the, the main result, I, I think this is a very important to highlight what's unique about the trade. So, so you, you link a trade to, to generate that extra uh, multiplicity. Uh, I think a multiple equilibrium may be kind of uh, gener generic features in this uh, kind of a scenario. I try to mark it a little bit on my own paper. I have a paper with my colleagues, uh, Craig Dodge and uh, Alexander Dyck, who just did the paper in the morning session. So we also study kind of the, the interaction between trade and the corporate finance. The corporate finance there is about the activism. So uh, if we have asymmetrical information setting, but we focus on so the, the, the size of the determination, the form formation of uh, uh, the investor collective action organization, basically this is more like a club. So you think about this is more like the board in, uh, in the current paper. So people can join this board and become larger and they can collaborate on their information. And uh, we show that in, in that case, free riding can drive multiple equilibrium. But it is kind of also the interaction between financial market and the corporate finance, and the interaction will also generate multiple equilibrium. I think this is more like it's a generic feature in this uh, kind of interaction between financial market and the corporate finance uh, uh, literature. So the, the next one is related to the, the marginal voter and the marginal trader. I, I think that the public information is very, very crucial in driving the di difference between marginal voter and the marginal trader. So otherwise, I, there's no difference because there's no belief shock that this marginal voter will become the marginal trader. Uh, the paper might want to highlight this. And if, uh, I, I, I think I already overused the time as zero. I just um, talk about it some very quickly, some, some, some uh, comment. And, uh, so, so the, the, the paper uh, again, so it's about the the, uh, so the motivation is people treat for voting basically. I, I, I think about the how, how 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 many people exactly treat for voting. I know section uh, se section uh, seven five one had a setting so people uh, only treat not for vote. I think if we, in the current setting, people very small, not a large investor, maybe they, they just trade for other reasons. Only large investors, they want to trade for, for vote. So uh, the, that, that, that's my thought. So I want, want to see the, how empirically relevant uh, for this particular setting. And the sec another section talk about the index trading. Uh, so in the current setting of the paper, so whether the asset is an individual stock or, or index. If an index maybe it's kind of vote is not very relevant, but if it's not an index, an individual stock, uh, so I think uh, people, the index traders still trade because they want to benchmark, right? So uh, I also think about the market liquidity, whether it is related to fundamentals. So some other questions, basically, I can talk to uh, Nadia and, and Daron later. Uh, so overall, I think this is definitely a great paper with a lot of results, very rich and a novel theory. And uh, I want to think about it, probably want to make the paper more focused, kind of provide some um, sharper analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leanne, for a very enthusiastic discussion. Uh, Nadia, would you like to take a minute to uh, quickly respond to uh, many points raised by Leanne? I, I'm not, uh, yeah, no, thank you so much, Leanne. This is a, 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 such a great discussion. I'd love to discuss these points with you. Uh, so since I only have one minute, there were so many uh, good points. So let me maybe just 
set um, in, in, in order, right? So you mentioned the question about um, asking the board in general, comparing a delegation to a general board. And what I wanted to say is, I would say conclu conclu we don't want to say that the only function of the board in practice is what we have in the paper. We don't, for example, consider the board's advisory role as informational advantage. So in that sense, we try to tackle a little bit less uh, ambitious uh, question, uh, question and try not to say this is the optimal board, right, ever. What we want to say is that the simple argument that is often made that if the board is biased and doesn't implement the interests of the uh, average shareholders, then shareholder voting should dominate is not, is not true when we take Stray into account. And that's the conclusion we really want to make. So that's, that was the reason why we didn't consider uh, general types of boards. Um, so you, yes, you made many uh, comments about the model as well. So maybe let me just mention one uh, about this marginal trader uh, and representative trader. So we have follow-up work in which we actually follow very closely something that you suggested uh, where all investors are marginal and very, all the results are very uh, similar there. So we have multiplicity of equilibrium as, and as well. So I think I'm out of my one minute. Maybe I should address some of the questions. I think we have maybe uh, time for one question. So I'll just pick one out of, uh, out of the few that's, uh, that are out there. So there's one question from Ali Lazarak. And uh, the question was, I'm not sure I understand the qualification of a biased board. It seems that in your model, the board is simply forward looking and understands that the shareholder base will change over time. So the board is acting optimally and doesn't have a bias. Perhaps you have in mind that my OP board. So let me, no, let me try to explain uh, better what, what we mean. Um, so uh, if we think about the board, so suppose, uh, think of a snapshot in time, for example, think of uh, a time when shareholders vote for the board in annual election. The question is, is the board that maximizes the welfare of the shareholder base at that time, cater, does, does it cater to the preferences of the average shareholder at that time during those annual elections? And our key conclusion is it is not the case. So it shouldn't, uh, the board that maximizes the welfare of those shareholders who vote in these annual elections shouldn't cater to their average preferences. Uh, it should cater to the more extreme uh, shareholders among them because uh, that this will ensure that those shareholders who no longer will be the shareholders at the time when the future important voting decisions is made, they sell for a higher price and thus their welfare is maximized while the shareholders who are there, the board caters to their preferences. So that's what we really mean by the bias board. Thank you, Nadia. Terrific.